Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Romeo and uh, I'll be uh, talking today about uh, a little introduction to uh, the Network and Information System Directive, uh, NISD. Um, and also, we all know that there's been a lot of buzz about GDPR, but uh, there was a silent one moving along with GDPR called uh, NIST Directive, and that's the one I'm, I'm going to be talking about today. Um, prior to doing that, you know, it will be the case of introducing myself and also going through some case study, uh, the aims of the directive and uh, the guidance that support that uh, directive and uh, the toolkit that the NCSC uh, developed and how we have customized it in, uh, in CGI and also what it means for uh, sector that are concerned. Um, well, uh, CGI has, has a gl at a glance, uh, we are in uh, 40 countries in more than 400 locations. Uh, our revenue is uh, 1.5 billion and uh, also we've developed uh, 175 IP solution now and we are servicing basically uh, 5,000 uh, cities and uh, the same with uh, our clientele as well. So, um, about me, went back to university recently as a mature student, uh, Cardiff University, graduated with uh, a BSc in information system and uh, carried on uh, doing a master in information security and privacy. Uh, since then, uh, was engaged in uh, working with the Welsh Government Assembly. I don't know if you guys remember the whole HMIC uh, CD got, you know, being lost and things like that. At the time, the government decided to review all the information assurance. So I was part of the audit team who were basically uh, surveying third party to make sure that they were complying with those new directives and control that input put, put in place. I've also worked uh, with financial services, uh, car insurance, admiral, credit insurance, uh, the likes of Atreides, uh, mainly uh, involved in uh, GDPR uh, readiness. Also um, flirted a little bit with uh, financial uh, fintech startup, uh, developing, being part of development team to do with uh, uh, developing messaging up to uh, uh, through payment system and, and the social light. Uh, since it's been nine months that, that I've joined CGI as a cybersecurity consultant and uh, at the minute I'm working in a smart metering program uh, and uh, I'm a PK administrator the, the dealing with crypto system, you know, issuing a, a digital certificate and the such like. Uh, when I'm not doing all of these, uh, I play wheelchair basketball and uh, I'm trying to see if I can run the London Marathon, but that's not, uh, that's quite a big deal for me. I don't actually know if I'm going to do that. It's quite hard. Okay, um, now. Before I start, I'd like us to go through, uh, I really like your help there, uh, through uh, a little scenario. Uh, let's say uh, there's a power uh, outage in London uh, for, let's say, two hours in one of the train stations. Can you possibly give me uh, the scenario that could occur? Anything that you can think of? Panic. <laughs> yeah, panic. What else? Lack of information. Information boards go down, can't see what's happening with the trains coming in or going out. Yeah. Not so, back to the stations before and after winter's trains can't get through it. Yeah. So, there's disruption in services, people are stranded, and uh, what else could we think of? Well, eventually, your NIS will kick in. Yeah. Reporting and everything for the NIS. Okay. And also, yeah, that's that's one thing. Uh, what about you know police being sent because there'll be a chaos, uh, people wanting to uh, go in other part of the country, and all those different systems being connected. That's going to be a massive kind of like disruption. So basically, um, this actually happened uh, in the beginning of the month, uh, and. Uh, in a matter of two hours, uh, about a million people were uh, affected 
by uh, a power outage that only lasted two hours. And uh, uh, it was a King Cross station. Uh, um, services there, you know, got can cancelled, and uh, it even affected Ipswich Hospital because they had a back of generator there that couldn't, uh, it couldn't uh, basically uh, make it function. And for about thirty minutes, uh, they they run out of uh, power. Imagine if they were carry out operations there and things like that. What could have happened? Uh, people, you know, weren't, weren't not being able to. Uh, uh, to join, uh, to to make phone call, you know, and things like that. Uh, they said there were problem with uh, uh, power power station. Uh, it wasn't a, a cyber attack, but it could have well been a cyber attack, and that would have been, you know, kind of the scenario that could have happened had it had, had it been had it occur like that. So, on a more uh, factual basis. Um, the Cambridge and uh, Centre for Risk Study carry out uh, uh, model some cost that could uh, um, generate, that could uh, derive as a result of a uh, sophisticated attack. And uh, it was basically, uh, it resulted, it, there was this, uh, it, it impacted, it would have impacted between 9 and 13 uh, million households. And uh, it, those would have lost uh, uh, electricity. And also uh, disruption around the same amount of people uh, would have, you know, it would have affected transportation, digital communication and water services. And in terms of money, uh, the loss that would have cost between uh, eleven point six and uh, eighty five point five billion, uh, and uh, over the next five years, the GDP uh, the GDP would have been affected uh, around forty nine billion to four hundred forty two billion. So I don't know if you guys remember. Also, uh, in two thousand and seventeen, yeah, there was the one cry ransomware phenomenon. Okay, uh, although uh, people didn't die, but uh, that affected a lot of people. Uh, NHS, uh, the 26 trusts were affected. Uh, out of the 26, we had 81 that were affected. And uh, so those scenario uh, is basically to let you know how um, with technology evolving now, the threat landscape as well is evolving. We have uh, computing being pervasive in, uh, in Information IoT been increasing, so uh, the the landscape is really increasing. And as we know, uh, legislation always play catch up. So if it was the case then for uh, the EU member state to try to come up with uh, a strategy to uh, to basically uh, provide legal, legal measure to ensure that uh, the overall level of security was basically uh, managed within the EU. So um, it was the case of setting up a computer um, a system response, incident response across those nations. It was the case of uh, improving communication, uh, making sure that uh, the culture of cyber security was uh, kind of like spread across a uh, member state. It was also the case of making sure that uh, uh, they can put some sort of best practice and informational toolkit that those uh, uh, members would be able to, uh, to derive all different control from that. And uh, so um, they identified the different different vital sector that uh, we can see there: digital services, energy, health, uh, transport, banking, uh, digital infrastructure, uh, financial uh, market, and uh, uh, basically uh, water as well. So those different sectors here in the UK are actually part of the critical national infrastructure. And it, so in terms of scoping, uh, the NISD covers uh, the vast majority of those sectors, apart from uh, banking and financial services that are already uh, regulated, uh, they already have their own uh, uh, legislative uh, framework. So, uh, when we speak about, we talk about uh, um, in this directive, there are three main stakeholders or uh, uh, component that we need to uh, bear in mind. We have what we call uh, operator of essential services, 
and uh, those are basically uh, organization that provides essential services that uh, uh, to do with uh, our daily life and that can have a massive impact as well on the economy and also uh, based on the fact that uh, the network and information system is concerned uh, any disruption to that will uh, be uh, very uh, will really disturb the the whole the whole uh, the whole setting so um the, the needs cover that aspect as well, and within it we also have a digital service provider, uh, the likes of a search engine, uh, online marketplace, and then a cloud service provider. Okay, the thing with uh, uh, the directive is, you know, it covers uh, organizations that are uh, that have more than 50 uh, employees and uh, with a turnover of uh, more than 10 million. So um, those different the the, the, the needs as well make sure that uh, there is there are competent authority within the member state that uh, are responsible of making sure that uh, uh, the organisation comply with uh, with the directive. And uh, in the case of uh, of NIS, it's actually you have uh, sector specific uh, uh, competent authority. So if you take water, you'll have a competent authority that is uh, related to water. And uh, so all operator of essential services, they are sector specific. But uh, uh, digital service provider, the competent authority there is the ICO as well. Yeah, so. Okay, so I talked about uh, the toolkit and best practice that uh, each member state uh, would uh, uh, develop. So the NCSC uh, develop uh, a framework which is basically an audit auditing tool and uh, for to allow organization to manage better manage the cyber security the risk uh, in relation to the operator of essential services. Uh, the directive itself come to force, as I mentioned earlier, almost at the same time as GDPR in May 2018. So, so how, what's the structure of uh, the whole framework? Uh, it's divided in basically four main objectives, uh, managing the risk, protecting against cyber attack, uh, detecting cyber incident, and then minimizing the impact of cyber incident. So do, underneath those uh, different objectives, you have uh, 14 principles. Uh, those 14 principles and uh, are underlined by what we call indicator of uh, of good practice. So each objective uh, principle are an indicator of uh, good practice, which is basically a statement, a declarative statement by which that needed to be abided to in terms of uh, making sure that uh, that specific objective is been is been complied to. And uh, you have the three degree of rating not achieved, partially achieved and also uh, achieve itself. So, and uh, those different uh, indicator of, uh, of good practice, um, you have in 39 individual assessment that uh, you would basically rate those objectives against. So uh, how uh, um, those are basically prescriptive uh, depending on the nature of the organization and the specificity of the organization is the case of really making sure how you can customize this and then make it work for yourself or for your organization or your organization that you're trying to assess. So us within CGI, um, so before uh, talking about you know how we do it in CGI, this is an example of uh, indicator of good practice of uh, good practice. So you have the principle there, secure configuration, and then followed by uh, the the whole indicator of good practice, and uh, you have the different statement that need uh, to be uh, filled or and the control that need to follow to uh, to basically uh, complete that uh, uh, that. Uh, um, indicator of good practice. So, so how did we do it? So basically, what we did is to take the fourteen principle, line them up, uh, and uh, within those um, principle, 
we came up with other components. For example, if we take governance, we will do governance will have three components, uh, board direction, role and responsibility, and decision making. And uh, we develop the, uh, we expand on uh, the, the NIST, the, the, the CAF uh, framework by adding extra uh, statement there. And uh, we classify them in terms of uh, degree of maturity. And those degree of maturity, uh, we mark them in terms of percentages. So you will have there 0%, 10%, 40%, 70%, up to 100%, and then scoring it. And uh, so those would be, uh, you now develop the control. That, uh, that's why we have a cyber assessment framework audit test. So you would line up all your uh, inquiries there or your examining, examining document and, and the such like. And basically you will, uh, you will result into them. So all the different, I did not include uh, the controls here because is uh, internal uh, uh, sensitive, but you will have a lot of uh, control indicators there that need to be fulfilled. So what you do is, okay, let's say you take uh, in this specific aspect governance uh, and we say third row, 40%, you will put a cross there. Uh, and then you'll fill all of those in terms of which at what level the organization is. And what it gives is basically each principle would tell you where they are in uh, their compliance. And uh, this is only a snapshot. You have all, uh, is a very long spreadsheet. And it will give you at the end this spider diagram. And uh, this spider diagram basically allows you to start the conversation with either your internal client or if you're a consulting firm, uh, your client. So, and uh, different aspect, uh, it gives you really the rating and you can basically tell to the client, okay, this is, you know, in a snapshot where you are and uh, what direction should we be uh, going towards to. So, um, this, we actually, enter, we have an internal tool in CGI called Iris. So, where... Uh, Previously, the spreadsheet will, uh, we integrated within our database, which basically means that, okay, uh, with all the control that are already there. So integrating this within our database allow us to basically run a risk assessment. And it, if it's to do with the operator of essential services, you will, you will have all those output straight away when you carry out your, your risk assessment. So, um, so the challenge is, uh, then would be definitely there will they, they need to be a business change program. Uh, there will be challenges in terms of those different sectors that uh, we already manage. Uh, we mentioned earlier organizations that are working with the government are really concerned. People who are doing uh, cloud computing offering, you know, shared services and so your incident notification will really, really need to be looked into. Uh, same with reporting it and also try, you know, how do you now integrate it between, you know, within your business continuity plan. Of course, the action, first of all, you need to certainly to do your risk assessment. Uh, you go, you're going to fine tune your, uh, your notification and within 72 hours, because the NIST is 72 hours, uh, and, uh, you have to adjust it and you have to report it to the NCSC. NCSC is not, uh, a competent authority. They're just acting as an incident response team. So they will certainly be giving you guidance there and, uh, aligning all of those, dragging them in such a the way that that can be aligned with your business continuity measure and what are the clear, the, clear, the, the clear benefit to that? You are compliant, not only are you compliant to NIST, but in vast majority of cases that align your compliance to GDPR as well. Uh, you will increase your business agility, uh, you'll have new business opportunity even in terms of bidding and uh, you'll develop expertise as well, uh, not uh, to mention that it'll give you a competitive advan advantage and uh, uh, you will avoid penalties. It's 17, up to 17 million. Uh, that's the real difference with GDPR. Uh, first of all, when this came out, the government was thinking of aligning it as well along the line of GDPR, but they said, you know, when there was that consultation, uh, they decided to keep it to up to 17 million. Yeah.
So that's pretty much it. Uh, that's me done. I hope uh, it made a little bit of sense to you guys, and uh, I welcome any questions. Yep. So um, I work for a managed service provider who are, have a turnover of over 10 million and more than 50 employees. And we provide infrastructure service to our customers on our own cloud platform. Would we be in scope? I, I think the government, so far, there is a slide here. The government. Okay. Yeah, if you go on um, NCSC website, uh, because this is since November 2018, I think the government was meant to publish a list. So, and at the time, there were 129 uh, companies that were listed. So, it's the case of trying to get in touch either with uh, NSCSC or uh, ICO to uh, have more clarity on that. And is it our responsibility to find out, or would they come and tell us if we need to be compliant? What I know is the information got uh, uh, circulated in terms of the organization that were basically deemed to be eligible or fall under that criteria. So, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, I work for the NHS, so the NHS has got the DSP toolkit, so it wouldn't need to do a separate framework because it's all aligned, as I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. It, this is uh, heavily aligned to uh, ISO 27000. Yeah. Something else? Okay, that's me done. If... Uh, My email address is there if you need more clarification in terms of everything to do with the NIST directive. I could, uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to assist. And, uh, I forgot to mention to put my Twitter there. But if you type in on Twitter, Romeo and Bolo, you'll, uh, you'll find me there and, uh, we can follow each other. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.